You can support In the Past Lane with as little as $1 a month. Just go to the support page at our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. In 1817, an enslaved man named Cornelius Elliott was living in the Illinois Territory. By law, Elliott should have been free, since Illinois was free territory. But his owner ignored the law. So Elliott, a skilled barrel maker, worked side jobs for wages and managed in 1819 to buy his freedom for $1,000. Six years later, he bought the freedom of his younger brother. They, in turn, worked to earn enough money to purchase their mother's freedom. And they almost certainly liberated more siblings and relatives in the coming years. Cornelius Elliott was one of hundreds, likely thousands, of freedom entrepreneurs, enslaved men and women who took advantage of limited opportunities to buy their freedom and begin new lives in the Northwest Territory. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 112, in which we explore the forgotten story of African-American pioneers who migrated to and thrived in the old Northwest Territory after the American Revolution. We are coming to you this week from the Fugitive Slave Act Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The benevolent overlord of this podcast is our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in the past lane this week? Well, classes have ended at my college, and we're in final exams and final papers mode until December 18th. That's when the grades are due. Then it's time to do a zillion other things that have been put on hold during the semester, plus do some Christmas shopping and get the house ready for the arrival of our kids and various relatives for the holiday. All in all, it's a busy but fun time of year. Here at In the Past Lane headquarters, we're selling lots of t-shirts. Apparently, a lot of you are taking my advice and checking out our many, many history-themed t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, tote bags, stickers, and more as you do your holiday shopping. And remember, every item sold brings In the Past Lane a little revenue that we use to keep this operation going. And my friends, there's another way you can help, by telling your friends about In the Past Lane. Personal recommendations are one of the most common ways that people discover new podcasts. So... Tell your friends, and maybe give us a shout-out on social media. Thanks. Okay, people. Hop aboard my sleigh. Your journey in the past lane begins now. When most Americans think about the frontier in the West, they draw upon images and ideas from popular culture especially Hollywood films. And if you've watched any of the hundreds of films produced before 1990, the American West and the frontier appear to have been settled only by white people of European descent. But if you've listened to one of my favorite In the Past Lane episodes of all time, episode 77, where I speak with historian Patricia Nelson Limerick about how new Western historians like herself have radically changed the way we see the West, you'll remember that the West, the real West and not the Hollywood version, was a place of incredible racial, ethnic, religious, and cultural diversity. Well, today's episode of In the Past Lane adds to this understanding by taking a close look at a long-forgotten chapter in U.S. history, the story of tens of thousands of African Americans who, in the 70 years before the Civil War and the end of slavery, settled on what was then the Western frontier, and today we know as the Midwest. They established successful farms and created thriving communities of black families. But intensifying racism in these years meant that these African Americans faced increasing attempts by white Americans in states like Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois to deprive them of their citizenship, land, and opportunities to get ahead. It's a fascinating story that is sure to surprise you. To tell this story, I'm joined today by Annalisa Cox. 
She is a historian who is currently a fellow at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Cox is a scholar whose work focuses on the history of race and racism in U.S. history. She's with me today to speak about her latest book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land, America's Black Pioneers and the Struggle for Equality. In the course of our discussion, Annalisa Cox explains how the Northwest Territory, what is now much of the Midwest, was established by Congress in 1787 and constituted the largest territory established in the New World that prohibited slavery. How thousands of African Americans migrated to this territory to establish small farms and businesses, and how many of them thrived, and some even became quite rich. How many enslaved African Americans brought to this territory worked extra hours for wages and bought their freedom and the freedom of their loved ones. How these migrants initially enjoyed full rights of citizenship, including voting rights, and freedom from racist laws limiting their civil rights. How, over time, however, as larger numbers of white settlers arrived and states like Ohio and Indiana were established, they succeeded in passing racist laws that prevented black migration or made it financially untenable. How white violence, as exemplified by the so-called Cincinnati Race War of 1829, challenged African-American freedom and their right to economic opportunity. And how in the early 20th century, long-established communities of black farmers began to disappear due to economic hardship and the rise of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Annalisa Cox, welcome to In the Past Lane. I'm glad to be here. Well, your book chronicles the forgotten story of tens of thousands of African-American pioneers who headed west to establish lives of freedom and prosperity in the 70 years before the Civil War. But before we dive into this story, I think it'd be beneficial to our listeners to have you start off by explaining the place where this happens. So tell us about the Northwest Territory and what made it uniquely attractive to African-American pioneers. Well, it's funny because when we think Northwest Territory, we often think of Oregon or Mm -hmm. California or the Rocky Mountains or something like that, right? But this is the, what later became known as the Old Northwest Territory, but which was our nation's first frontier after the American Revolution. So this is the region that became the states of Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a smidge of Minnesota. But it's a very, very large portion of the new nation. It practically doubles the land mass of the original 13 colonies that uh, signed on to that Declaration of Independence. And its governing ordinance was written in 1787 at the same time as our nation's governing ordinance, our nation's constitution. And it's a very important piece of land, and it's an incredibly important frontier. Some historians are now arguing it actually touched off the Revolutionary War because of the fact that George III actually stole a colonization rights away from the colonists who fought to have it become part of Britain mm-hmm. in the 1760s. But it then became an incredibly important piece of land after there was this brand new nation called the United States, because it was the largest piece of land ever to be set aside as free from slavery in the new world. So this is very, very foundational and important in the creation of the new nation. But it also has equal voting rights. And this is a little bit harder to see in this document. It's a four-page document. Anybody can look it up on the Library of Congress website. It's really fascinating because in this document, which governs this entire region, the word white is never used once. And it is not used deliberately. So this is not just a mistaken omission. Mm -hmm. This is an omission to open up equal rights under the law, and equal political rights. And obviously, in order to vote, they're very clear. You have to be male. You have to be over the age of 21. You have to own at least 50 acres of land. And I believe it's 200 acres of land to run for office. But there is absolutely no mention of the race of the person who can do this. So the understanding was that that meant that the person could be black or white. And so as the slow emancipation, as Ivor Berlin calls it, this period of slow emancipation that's occurring as all of these slave states are giving up slavery, there is a rapidly growing population of free African Americans in the new nation. And they view themselves as citizens. They are actually viewed as citizens Mm -hmm. as soon as they own property by most of American states at this time. And I think this is a surprise for a lot of people I talk to, even legal scholars, that in 1792, when George Washington ran for president for his second term as president, the vast majority of American states, including slave states, 
had equal voting rights for black or white men. So that made the Northwest Territories this uniquely American, uniquely sort of Enlightenment era, revolutionary period, idealistic, almost utopian minded space. And African Americans started to flood into this region. Right. And they see all these things. And they also see these just broad ideas of frontier opportunity, that this is, you know, in many cases, they can acquire land very inexpensively, or some cases for free. And one of the interesting things that comes out in the book is that as African Americans are the free blacks are making this choice to head west where they know it's going to be difficult, but the opportunities, the upside is potentially quite great, is that there's another, you know, movement that's that's gaining steam or at least gaining traction in the east, and that is colonization. The idea that African Americans should gain their freedom and head to Liberia or other free colonies outside of the United States. And they explicitly reject this idea. Can you tell us a little bit more about their consciousness, their sense of themselves as Americans and as people seeking to get a piece of what we later would call the American dream. Yes, and I should say these were people who were fiercely opposed to the colonizationist movement. So this is the movement that was actually formed very specifically in mind originally by enslavers with the notion that a free and equal black population in America would endanger slavery. And it morphed and it changed, but it never once changed from its notion that African descended people who were free in the United States should not be in the United States. They should be somewhere else, anywhere else. And even briefly for a time, it was considered that they should just be pushed further west into sort of Indian territory. But these people were claiming American land and they were claiming equality. They were claiming their American citizenship at a time when there was a real fervor for freedom. And we have to realize, you know, there's a big, even between 1787 and the rise of the colonization movement, which is sort of mid-1810s, that's a big chunk of time. Mm -hmm. That's the formative years. And I always think it's very important to stress here that these founding citizens, these black founding citizens and their white allies really had a very strong sense that this was the direction the United States should be and was actually going. I mean, they were voting, they were settling land, they were building forts along the Wabash River, they were becoming Indian agents, sort of think Buffalo soldiers, but during the time of Jane Austen. Right, right? exactly. And some of them, despite laws against it, were actually fighting in the War of 1812. And many of these were even American patriots or descendants of American patriots who'd fought for the United States in the Revolutionary War. So the very, very strong sense of themselves as Americans, and they were, of course, also anti-slavery, but very strongly pro-equality. And I think that those two things together are very important to remember that there was two dichotomies going on before the Civil War. There was the slavery versus freedom, but there was also the equality versus prejudice or equality versus no equality or lack of citizenship. And that for these pioneers in particular, their sense of the situation was not that they were trying to achieve equality, but that equality had at one point been achieved and then stolen from them, that they understood that there was a backlash that occurred. And this is referenced, as I mentioned in my book, more than once by Black equal rights activists, particularly in the Midwest, starting in the 1830s and 1840s, and they make reference to the 1787 ordinance and this ideal and this achievement of equal rights to vote, equal citizenship rights that had been stolen. And they were very much aware in 1803 when Ohio was the first state to be carved out of this territory, the white majority in Ohio at that time, when they created their first constitution, added the word white back in to steal the right of the land-owning and propertyed African Americans who were already in that region to vote. Right. So it's going to be a story of, you know, they're not just simply going to move out west and the biggest challenge is the weather and tree stumps and, right. and Native Americans, but it's, you know, it's a changing dynamic year by year. And they're being followed by lot much larger numbers of white Americans who True. are going to bring with them the prejudices of the East. And so, as you say, from 1787 to 1803, Ohio doesn't discriminate. It has no legal distinction between white and black citizens. But in 1803, when Ohio becomes a state, they explicitly put that in there. 
But before we go into, into that part, because that seems to be really the part of the struggle, maybe a little, you could tell us a little bit more. I think our listeners would like to know a little bit more about who these, you know, the profile of some of these African-Americans. You point out that some of them are recently emancipated. Some of them were born free and came from a wide range of areas across the United States. And there's also a particular group that you focus on that you call freedom entrepreneurs, people like James Wilkerson. Could you tell us a little bit more about who these people are? And then we'll move back into that question about how they have to struggle against an increasingly hostile political order. Yes. So this is an incredibly diverse and so very American group of people. I sometimes think that they really did, they were just coming from so many different regions. And one of the things I want to stress is that this is such a massive movement. It was very difficult to organize and write this book because so many times books, particularly about African-American history, like to focus on the first and the only, right? Mm -hmm. That's a term that a wonderful African-American lawyer in Indianapolis was talking to me about the other day. And she was saying, oh, yeah, it's that problem with the first and the only, right? But this is actually a movement. We're talking about tens of thousands of people rising, becoming immensely successful, even very wealthy in across this region that we now think of as the Midwest, but which at the time was our most valued frontier. It was considered the best land, the best farmland, the best waterways. So this is, this is an incredibly pivotal moment and movement. This is not just a few families. This is, by the time the book went to press, it was over 330 settlements basically integrating this region by the time of the Civil War. Right. And that's what you say, 338. That's what your research has yielded. Yes. That you've been able to identify these settlements. Yes. Because when I started this book off, the assumption among historians was that there was five, maybe six across this region. So in terms of these people, yes, some of them are from families who had been free since the 1600s. Some of them are brought there to be freed. Although I was particularly interested in African-American agency, so I deliberately avoided focusing on the few and the rare sort of large movements like the Just Settlement where you had an enslaver who was bringing in 100 people to free. While that did happen, the majority of people who arrived in the Midwest did not arrive that way. They arrived on their own volition, through their own choice, and through their own agency. And there were thousands of people who I termed these freedom entrepreneurs. So these are people who, as enslaved people, worked extra hours and extra time to earn money to purchase their own freedom. And I focus on two in particular in my book, Cornelius Elliott and Major James Wilkerson. But there were literally thousands, and many of them were women, actually. And so they are doing this unbelievably difficult task And they're also being charged usury rates for themselves because how are you going to negotiate with somebody who owns, you know, they own your body, they own your labor. And there was unfortunately a lot of corruption. So somebody would work for years to raise the $600 to purchase themselves and then find it stolen from them or that they were being sold. But there were some who were successful in this. And I find them particularly fascinating because they are arriving on this frontier with nothing but themselves, right? The rest of their friends or family are still enslaved. And in fact, they often bear the burden of that and are coming to this frontier in order to raise more money to purchase those family members. But they are also, I think, in a very intriguing way, a way that historians might want to think about the Frederick Jackson Turner pioneering thesis. So this is a thesis that Mm -hmm. argued and became popular in the 1890s as a way of defining who and what Americans are. And it was this vision of this white young man going out to the frontier by himself and making it and, and achieving success. And it has been justly criticized by historians who've found it to be an inadequate and usually inaccurate Mm -hmm. (laughs) portrayal of what white pioneers were particularly in this region. However, if we look at these freedom entrepreneurs who are arriving on this frontier truly alone with nothing but their own labor, then I'm beginning to think that maybe Turner wasn't wrong, but that the frontier thesis is about a pioneer who's not white, but who is black. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is a fascinating thought, right? Right. Not exactly what he had in mind. Not exactly. <laughs> right. We often say that about, about myths. Myths are not necessarily false. They're just, they're off target or they're, they misrepresent or they only tell part of the story. True. So uh, I think that certainly is the case of his frontier thesis. So it's hard to know exactly how many people go there, but you note that there's 63,000 African-Americans that show up and a lot of your research is based on census work. And that, as you point out, is the equivalent of if we're in a territory to apply for statehood, they needed 60,000 residents. So it's effectively the... This is, yeah, this is more than a state's worth of African-Americans in this region by the time the Civil War broke out. Yes. Right. And that, those are the ones counted. You note that some people were missed and some people intentionally refused to be counted because they were in, in a way protesting or protecting themselves from the federal government. Correct. And of course, beyond farmers, there's also you focus on the farming because that's really the principal way people earn their money. But there probably were thousands of blacksmiths and carpenters and shop owners and things like that, other kinds of entrepreneurs in this region as well. So it's a diverse group in very much every respect. And they're, they're also doing more than farming. They're, you know, they're clearing land and planting crops and all, but they're also engaging in activism to protect their rights. They're also running for office. You profile one individual in particular, John Langston, and they're establishing schools, which are integrated. So tell us more about some of the, the ways in which they're building community and uh, building, trying to protect themselves as well. Yes. So these African-American pioneers coming out into this region, and I, and I should stress that the map in the front of the book is massively conservative. It does not include any of the areas that later became urban. Obviously, some of these pioneers were coming out before there was a Chicago or an Indianapolis or any of the other major Midwestern cities that we now take so much for granted. But I was really keeping this only to property owning farmers and farming settlements. And this was at times immensely frustrating because I would come across, I remember I came across a general store owner, Frontier, Wisconsin in 1860. This is before Laura Ingalls Wilder family was out there, right? This is before the little house in the big woods. And he is on the frontier of Wisconsin and he already has a general store and business that's worth $9,000 which puts him on the level of a millionaire mm. at that time. Yeah. And he's not the only one. There's so many people like that that I deliberately did not include because I was keeping it just about farmers and farming. But this is really and truly the Midwest was integrated in ways that we're only just beginning to understand. But they were using their wealth and their success and their land ownership and their extraordinary expertise at being market farmers to then use as a base to become equal rights activists. And admittedly, they're just purely their symbolic importance to anybody, whether we're talking about Justice Taney who, when he's making his 1857 uh, notorious Supreme Court Dred Scott decision, or whether we're talking about state or local white politicians creating anti-immigration laws, or any of the racist laws that were created in this region, they are in response to their knowledge of these African-Americans succeeding and rising to massive levels. So these African-American farmers are then becoming the foundation of an equal rights movement, a convention movement that starts, and originally these black conventions uh, started on the East Coast right after the Cincinnati Race War of 1829, but they quickly spread to the Midwest. And they are, I would say, probably more cohesive, more coherent, and more effective in many ways than the East Coast conventions, especially the national conventions were, which were also often torn by strife and internal difficulties. But these Midwestern state conventions were incredibly well-funded, incredibly well-organized, and at least where Ohio is concerned, actually effective in rolling back racist black code laws, which hindered some forms of equality, especially immigration equality into this region. Yeah, could you tell us more about those black codes? We're familiar with the term black code as a historical term, and students certainly remember that's a Reconstruction idea, that in during Reconstruction, black codes were passed and they become a big point of contention in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. But you're referencing an earlier version of this. These are black code bonds, and they're designed to curb immigration, what we would call classically or you know internal migration from one part of the United States to another into these Midwestern states. So tell us more about this effort to staunch this migration using this financial instrument. 
Yes. And I would say this is an incredibly important area that is really going to require more research because historians, because they didn't know this population was there, assumed that these black code bonds were just sort of created out of fear, but were not used and were not upheld broadly. And my research found exactly the opposite, is that they were created in response to a rapidly growing and very successful African-American population, and that they were used to devastating effect The map in the front of my book shows particularly the effect that they had in Illinois, which had some of the most vicious and horrific anti-immigration laws and black code laws. So these were laws that said that when you came in, you had to have somebody sign on who's already there, which makes being early on the frontier difficult, Mm -hmm. already there to sign a bond that said you would not break the law and not become poor and not fail. And it had to be a $500 bond. Very quickly, Illinois made their bond $1,000. Which is a huge amount of money in those days. Correct. Just to put this in perspective, this isn't like in the 1820s, right? At a time when $500 could, the city of New York spent $500 to buy an entire new fire engine in Mm -hmm. the 1820s. So this this is just a massive amount of money. And local politicians were corrupt enough that they were often just if a local African-American would become too successful, would just challenge them for the $500 and just demand it in Mm -hmm. cash. And there's actually oral history narratives that have been passed down within some of these successful African-American farming families where they had to go in front of a judge and actually bring that judge $500 in cash in order not to be removed from their farm in the state. So these were highly effective, but it wasn't just about these these were not the only forms of anti-immigration used. They were just straight up anti-immigration laws. The first was Illinois in the late 1840s. These were actually changes to the constitution of these states. So the first anti-immigration laws created in the United States are created through changing state constitutions, and they are aimed directly at people of African descent. Illinois is the first. Indiana is the second. And these laws are upheld. And they bar the migration of free African-Americans into those states. Period. Any at all. And Illinois had a particular sting in its tail. By 1853, it had added onto their constitution an additional amendment that said if an African-American entered the state of Illinois and could not pay an extremely high fine for doing so if they were arrested by a sheriff or a local law person, that they could be sold into slavery to recoup the losses incurred in capturing them. And this was not a neutral threat. I found at least two examples, including in Lawrence County, Illinois, where a young man crossed the Wabash River to work and was actually put up for auction on the county courthouse steps. This is in the 1850s. And The irony of this is that Lawrence County was originally settled in the 1790s by the Morrises and the Tans, who are some of the earliest pioneers of any race, but they happen to be free African-American, to settle that region of the territory, which later became the state of Illinois. And they had been originally free and propertied African-Americans in uh, South Carolina, in the Charleston area. So these are, in many ways, backlash laws, right? Right. They are to respond to an an immensely old, established, and successful African-American population in those regions. Right. So they're reflecting the intensified political situation and concerns about slavery and anti-slavery, but they're responding directly to what's happening, what's been happening for decades now, which is that African-Americans are achieving success and somehow this is seen as an affront to uh, white opportunity and hence the, these laws. And, and part of them are these legal mechanisms that are used, fines and immigration bans, but also a great deal of violence. And this violence occurs in the East, but also in many of these newly emerging communities. And one that you devote an entire chapter to, the Cincinnati, it has different, as, as with all clashes, it has different names historically, the Cincinnati race riot, the Cincinnati race war. Tell us more about these waves of violence and how they are, again, kind of a premonition of what's going to occur after the Civil War in other parts of the country. Yeah, and there are haunting, haunting aspects of this in what's happening in the South after the Civil War. 
it's almost as if a white elite in the South took a, their legal and real sort of roadmap from the Northeast and the Midwest in order to figure out how they were going to deal with what they knew would be a rapidly rising African-American free population if they didn't stop it in its tracks. Uh, they, they really did have a model to go off of, right. and the model was created in these regions. But the violence that arose actually arose first in the cities of the Northeast and the Midwest. So the cities were not the places where any kind of advancement was being made. The cities were where the color line was being violently created. The cities of the North, both the Midwest and the Northeast, were where segregation was actually being invented after there had been a lot more integration and equality right after the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And this is in every aspect. So this is from churches, which had been integrated, becoming segregated, schools being integrated, becoming segregated, cities becoming segregated. And this was often done through extreme violence. I was sometimes reminded in haunting ways of Kristallnacht, right? The event that occurred in Germany in the 1930s. But this is the 1830s, and it is every single major city of the North. This violence is sweeping through these cities, and it's attacking the engines of Black success. So it's these are highly organized, well-funded mobs, which are attacking churches, meeting halls, entire neighborhoods, schools, in more than one case, orphanages. These are devastating periods of violence. The first in the Midwest was the Cincinnati Race War of 1829. That city was hit by two subsequent terrible riots. And these were not, I want to be very clear, these were not just sort of low lives and riffraffs being stupid. Right, a bar fight that gets out of control. Right. This is this is about newspaper editors actually saying, hey, you know, African Americans are becoming too successful. Meet here at this time, at this date, we will hand out guns. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. sometimes it was actually, these were posted in sheriff's offices, these kind of meetings to do this. So this is not, and I'm not, I know I'm not the first, um, the first historian to note this, but I think that especially with the rise of digital humanities and our ability to look at more newspapers, that we're only just beginning to understand the level of violence that arose in the cities of the North in the 1830s and how that affected who our nation is and what our nation is today. Right. And a lot of times these, in fact, almost every case, these are called riots, mm. but they're really, as you note earlier in your reference to Kristallnacht, they're really pogroms. They're organized attacks, one group, whites attacking another group, African Americans and yes. seeking to punish them, to kill them in some cases, and also to ruin their economic opportunity. True. So they end up destroying property and destroying newspapers. And so it's it's a very highly organized campaign, as you point out. And I find what happened in Pennsylvania particularly chilling because, as I point out in my book, Philadelphia is hit by one wave of these riots after another. And the devastation is extraordinary. But at the same time this is happening, Whites are going to the polls to ratify a new state constitution, which takes away the right to vote from free and propertied African Americans that they had had for generations. So this is a double-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. It's both it's political and legal violence, and it's also on the ground violence. But the thing that's fascinating about the Northwest Territory states is that these propertied farmers and their success, there is actually more space in the frontier and rural regions of the Northwest Territory states during this period for integration, for abolitionism to occur than there is in almost any other portion of the United States at this time. So when schools are being burned to the ground for African Americans, even in places like rural Connecticut and rural Vermont, there are not just schools for African Americans being created in the rural Midwest, there are integrated schools, pre-collegiate institutions mm -hmm. being built and funded. And they are not just by whites. These are not just a paternalistic project. These are schools that are being funded and founded by African-American farming families who by the 1840s are established and wealthy enough to be able to create these institutions. And some of them are truly revolutionary. I have to admit, I don't like the word radical because it was a slur used by 
anti-equality and pro-prejudiced activists of the 1830s to slur abolitionists who were in many cases much older (laughs) than they were because they were hanging on to the old ideals of the early republic where there had been more equality and more integration, just on the ground equality in terms of voting rights than there were that were being reversed. So in many ways, odd as it may sound, an old politician in Ohio in the 1830s who's being slurred as radical by pro-prejudice and pro-slavery young men is actually conservative. And the fact that he is arguing against slavery and arguing for equal voting rights makes him, in an odd way, conservative at that time, right. not radical. Right? Yeah, the real radicals are the ones invoking these new laws and these new policies to radically turn back the equality that they see flourishing around them. Yeah. And in fact, I should point out for the Lincoln scholars out there that Lincoln's first recorded speech when he's a young man in Illinois towards other young white men right after Elijah Lovejoy. This is Lovejoy, the uh, abolitionist. Right. The abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy is killed in one of these kind of well-organized mob activities in the Midwest. And Lincoln actually states this. He says, Maybe it's because that founding generation is dying off and us young white men want to create a different kind of United States. But he's very cautionary about doing that. I have to say, I think he drifted quite a long way from that stance as he became a politician Mm -hmm. and got older. And it took him a while to return to those roots. But he was incredibly astute in his observations about what was going on in terms of racism, even at that time. Yeah, it's a fascinating time period. And in terms of, you know, the widening the lens here to look at the whole story here as we head towards the conclusion of our chat here, what happens? We know there's tens of thousands of African-American farmers, many of them succeeding, but having to fight to defend that success. Then comes the Civil War. What's the longer story of this African-American pioneer entrepreneurism that's so striking in this antebellum period? Well, the short answer to that question is that the Midwest no longer looks like the map in the front of this book. And that's a very, very chilling reality. As you know, my book ends with the Civil War. I do a brief epilogue where I basically say what I think needs further research and further work. Certainly, our understanding of the massive and powerful rise of the Ku Klux Klan in this region in the early 20th century needs to be completely reconsidered in the face of this population. This population absolutely was still in existence in very similar, not totally similar numbers because the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act did have a profound effect on many of these African-American farming communities who just literally had to pull up stakes and move further north and further west in order to survive. Right, to protect themselves. Right. But even W.E.B. Du Bois, in a very early study he did of the 1890 census, found that by 1890, African-American farmers owned more property and better property than any other region in America. So the rise of the Klan in the early 20th century was really and truly racist at its core in the Midwest. And it was in response to these very successful African-American farmers and some of the worst violence that we are now aware of, like the terrible hanging of those two young men in Marion, Indiana, the photograph. Probably the most famous. Right. Probably one of the more famous photographs was in a county where there were early and successful African-American pioneers who by the 1840s had a thriving AME church that they had established. So the correlation between these pioneering settlements and the rise of racism in the 20th century is one that's going to probably need a lot more inspection and work. As I keep saying to my fellow historians, this is an entire field. Mm -hmm. My book is far from perfect. It is literally the tip of the iceberg, and there needs to be so much more work and so much more research done on the aspects both before and after the Civil War of this population. Right. And it gives us a strong, you know, real clear insight into, you know, there's so many points in American history where this goes on, but where 
black achievement is is hobbled and hampered and that their white counterparts who have small farms and small businesses and all are able to acquire capital and to pass that capital on to their children and their children's children and that sort of puts them on that slow escalator of success whereas african americans generation to generation face these you know whether it's a law or a mob things that just literally destroy their property and destroy that foundation that they're trying to build and making it incredibly difficult to create a thriving and enduring black middle class. Your story here really gives us sort of early chapters of that story, the part that after the Civil War and into the 20th century is a little better known. So it is a tragic and grim part of American history, but one that, as you point out, needs to be told. And I guess that leads me to my next question or final question, which is, you know, I ask all of the people that I interview on this podcast, you know, why does this matter now? History is interesting and fascinating and all, but, you know, it really ought to have something to say about the present. And I think it's pretty clear from our conversation and your book that uh, this does have a lot to say. So tell us, how would you put it, if I were to say, what, why does a story of the antebellum years in American history, why does it matter now? What does that story tell us that's useful in 2018? There are so many direct correlations. And when I was on book tour this summer, people would often come up to me and really startled by the correlations between this history and what is happening today. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, for a lot of the African-Americans who have read this book or have heard my talks, they don't find it as distressing. They Actually, what they do is they find it heartening because there's a poisonous myth in America, which still has a pretty strong hold that African-Americans as a group have never risen in America. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's very real reasons. I mean, most of them were enslaved before the Civil War. But this narrative of rising across this valued landscape before the Civil War is actually an incredibly encouraging and heartening one to a lot of African-Americans. So I should just state that to start. But if we think about where we are today as a nation, everything from anti-immigration laws how they're being created, and who they are being created against. When we think about people's skin color, this is incredibly potent and important to remember this history. If we think about even the term constitutional conservatism, what exactly do we mean by that if we think about this history? If we think about who belongs, who doesn't, who's a citizen, who is not a citizen, and then on-the-ground information. For example, the state of Michigan today has the second most segregated public school system in America, second only to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. This history, in many ways, explains why the six cities in America that are the worst for African Americans to achieve economically, to have economic achievement, are all northern, and four of them are northwest territorial state cities. Right. So there are just very real ramifications if prejudice was being put into place. And many of these politicians in the 1830s in this region were so prescient. They were saying, look, if we institute prejudice into our state constitutions, into our state laws against a group of people for something as arbitrary as the color of their skin, then couldn't that prejudice be aimed or attached to any other group? You know, prejudice is poisonous to the project of a democratic republic. And I think that we need to go back to this history to refresh ourselves on just how strange an invention the color line and segregation is and why we take it for granted in the cities across America, particularly in the North. Right. And this notion that we can't get along because we can't get along. And there are so many chapters in American history, this one in particular, that shows that a functioning, thriving, multiracial democracy has, in fact, been the case right. in our history. And it's our turning away from that, you know, allowing people to thwart that at various points that has created that sort of notion that it's just hopeless, when in fact, there are great examples from our very own past that we can uh, use as examples for the future. So, Annalisa Cox, this has been a great conversation and a really fascinating one. And your book has really opened my eyes. I I'm often surprised by when I interview people how much I, you know, as a professional historian, how much I need to know, <laughs> how much I need to learn. And uh, this is certainly a real eye opener. It's going to change the way that I teach some of my courses. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us at In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Annalisa Cox is the author of The Bone and Sinew of the Land 
America's Black Pioneers and the Struggle for Equality. Published by Public Affairs Books and available everywhere. To learn more about this period in U.S. history, check out past In the Past Lane episodes such as Episode 68, featuring my conversation with historian Ed Ayers about his book, The Thin Light of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America. And Episode 74, where I speak with historian Linda Gordon about the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan in the early 20th century. And, of course, the aforementioned Episode 77, where I speak with historian Patricia Nelson Limerick about the new Western history. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, it's mid-December. You in the holiday spirit? Ho, ho, ho. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 